Twincam appears to be a channel populated mostly with British cars, and in over three years of rambling with you lovely lot, I seem to have somehow never focused on a Jaguar. But today's the day that changes, and what a Jag to start with. Sir William Lyons' company has one of the longest and most revered histories of saloon car production, but in that lineage, one car, quite unexpectedly, has wound up with iconic status, the 3.8 litre Mark II. What was initially just a very heavy facelift of their existing compact saloon car ended up being central to Jaguar's reputation for building phenomenally capable and phenomenally fast luxury cars. But before I forget, this car is currently being auctioned by Bidding Classics, a new online classic car marketplace that already has a raft of cool old cars on offer. So if you'd like to maybe take a punt, then do please follow the link in the description. Before we start actually caring about the car itself though, I want to make one thing clear. In the 1960s, Jaguar had a very different image compared to the one it has today. Since the 1980s, Jags have nearly always been driven or used by three certain types. Old men, who want a stylish but graceful luxury car. Cabinet ministers, as they're bundled into the back of a black XJ after their latest illicit scandal. And most importantly, cads. We're not talking about necessarily bad people here, but there's just a level of cheek. I wouldn't necessarily trust a modern Jag driver with telling me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But rewinding 60 years and that gentle caddishness, the general nerve of a Jag driver morphs into two things. First, and most generously, racing. Jaguar won at Le Mans in 1951, 53, 55, 56 and 1957 and made themselves a reputation for building some of the best and some of the fastest sports cars in the world, with that aura transferring seamlessly over into their saloons, as a series of Jags were the preferred mode of transport for the racers of the world. But the caddishness of the modern Jag driver morphs more directly into pure criminality. While the respectable members of the middle and upper classes drove Humbers and Rovers, the criminals wanted something a little faster, for obvious reasons. But that's not to say that Jags were driven by every criminal. Only the types with the dignity to appear outwardly respectable would drive one of these. The kind of people that were a bit shady, but as far as anyone knew, were just well-off normal folk. Until you got on the wrong side of them, and your decapitated body ended up in the boot. But as I alluded to a minute ago, the Mark II's success was relatively unexpected, and as the name suggests, it's a revised version of the original Jaguar 2.4 and 3.4 litre saloons, known retrospectively as the Mark I. The car that would one day epitomise Jaguar began its story at the dawn of the 1950s, in a project known as Utah. Utah was to be an all-new compact saloon car, opening Jaguar up to a much wider market and hopefully increasing production volume, therefore insulating them from the pressures of the large luxury saloon and sports car markets. This was made possible by Jaguar's move a couple of miles across Coventry, from Swallow Road to the now iconic Browns Lane, then home of Daimler, who Jaguar eventually bought out. The new factory was much larger, allowing a bump up in production figures. But the new car wouldn't just be a filler beneath the Mark 7 and XK140. Instead, it would bring that level of performance into the compact sector, with a lovely straight six, and become the first production Jaguar to have a monocoque construction. What we now know as the Jaguar Mark 1 was launched at Earl's Court in 1955, and over the coming years, cemented a reputation for being a smooth, comfortable and sensible car that just also happened to be monstrously fast. But it wasn't long before William Lyons himself began to pick at certain components. No car in that era emerged perfect, but for that man, the Mark I wasn't enough. 
him and his team of brilliant engineers went away to come up with a facelift, addressing virtually all of the Mark 1's ills, but concentrating on three areas, the interior, the steering, and the stability. But the big telltale difference between a Mark 1 and a Mark 2 is the styling. So many cars in the late 1950s were stuck in the fuddy-duddy image of an England that didn't really exist. They were respectable, but not pretty. The most rakish a saloon car really got was a Humber Hawk or a Ford Anglia, both of which aped American tastes. The Mark I Jaguar was a great looking thing, but was stunted by the small glass house and rear wheel arch panel that gave it too much of a flat area. It was graceful, but lacked dynamism, and that's exactly what the Mark II corrected. Realistically, the styling is only subtly different, changing more due to practicality than will. But the Mark II's larger wheel arches, flush windows, slender pillars and extra chrome elevate it into this supremely dashing and graceful car. A line commonly used to describe sports cars is that they look fast standing still. And here, that's true of a four-door saloon car. This was the era in which Sir William Lyon sat in his garden and styled Jaguars himself. But with the hindsight of a few years of Mark I production, he was an artist. All Jaguars of this era were beautiful, curvaceous and recognisable as nothing else. Which makes the Mark II nothing unusual, but only compared to other Jags. There were some great looking saloon cars about in the 60s, but none had quite the character of the Mark II Jag. And just in case you forgot what it was, the name Jaguar is featured twice on the boot. But the details of all the badging is indicative of its advances, because on the back we're reassured by the all-round disc brakes, and at the front we're warned by 3800cc of six-cylinder power. And that's delivered by one of the most famous engines ever produced, the XK. So good, it even gave its name to a line of sports cars, one of which was the fastest production car in the world. It ended up in all the Jag saloons through to the 1980s, and of course under the bonnet of the C, D and E types. This engine was introduced in 1948, and is a proper racing engine. With all that Le Mans and Monte Carlo winning pedigree, with twin overhead camshafts when many were still using side valves. And just look at it. The engine bay is very nearly as pretty as the car itself. The Jaguar engraving on the oil cap, the polished cam covers, the twin carburettors and their little filters. But again, these were just a carryover from the Mark I in either 2.4 or 3.4 litre capacities. But because of the other changes, which we'll get to, the Mark II was up to 75 kilograms heavier than its predecessor. So the same power outputs meant that it was slower. And that just wouldn't do. They did fit a different cylinder head to eke a little more power out of the 2.4, but of course the real solution was to make the engine bigger. So the 3.4 XK was bored out to 3781cc, otherwise known as the same capacity as in the XK150. According to Jaguar, these things produce 220 brake horsepower. Now that's not entirely comparable because that's a gross figure, but still it sounds great. 220 brake horsepower. That means these things are do not 60 in eight and a half seconds and they do 125 miles per hour. And what a place to sit and cruise at speed. The exterior is the obvious way to tell the difference between a Mark 1 and a Mark 2, but the interior is almost totally different. And we've already said about how beautiful and gracious this car looks, but this is just incredible. I mean, you've got all the red leather and the walnut dash, and it's all beautifully done, so nicely polished. It's just absolutely incredible. There's no interior of this time period was quite as cool as this. 
obviously you can get more expensive cars and you get cars with theoretically better materials and later in production these got worse but at this period there was nothing cooler nothing cooler at all first of all we've got two big dials in front of us the speedometer goes up to 140 in 1959 and the tachometer we've got a tachometer first of all it's just the coolest thing in the world and then in the center we've got a big row of gauges we've got an ammeter we've got oil pressure we've got water temperature and a fuel gauge and then we've got this big row of lovely toggle switches for all the wipers and lights and listen to how they click i mean that's just the best thing you got um, even all of these things they don't have little images below them they're all obviously written down on the panel um as you'd expect for the era to be honest um, and they're all a little bit strange for where they're laid out and stuff so we've got the ignition in in the middle but next to the ignition rather than having the starter button in between them we've got the cigar lighter now of course it, it's a cigar not a cigarette because there's no way you would ever smoke a cigarette in a jaguar it would be a cigar um but they're all a little bit randomly laid out but they look brilliant that's just the best thing in the world. Love them so much. There's something modern manufacturers miss about switches, proper physical switches that feel brilliant. And in the centre, we've even got one for the lights as well. Of course, the dim dip is down on the floor like it is on every car of this era. And then in front of us, we've got this huge, you know, very spindly little steering wheel, very much of its time. But these cars are power steering. I don't quite know why you need a steering wheel quite so big, but still it's there and it's very very cool with this extra horn ring below it and then also in front of us where it would be your gear selector for if you have an automatic car yes they were available in automatic but we'll gloss over that here in the manual it says overdrive and i guess that the um, stalk to the right is what does your overdrive I've not actually done my research properly on this but i think that's what it does because i guess the one on the left has indicators judging by the way it feels um, and so yeah, talking about gearboxes and stuff, let's talk about the driving position. The steering wheel is in the perfect position, maybe a little bit low just because it's huge, um, but the pedals are way off to the right. It does mean you've kind of got a footrest, um, but still the pedals are way off to the right, but they are big, huge pedals. And in the middle, you've got this gear lever. It's so simple, again, all red leather around it and just this simple black gear knob, um, which is just brilliant and it clicks through the four speed manual so beautifully it's just it's just the business can you tell i love this thing and then even better we've got a period his master's voice hmv radio down at the bottom their speaker grill and an ashtray below here it's all coated in red leather it's all so just lovely in the center actually we have a little storage hole which has in it we'll get to that in a second actually because on the left hand side of it there is a little pull lever for a vent that lifts up the vent in the scuttle panel so that you can get a little bit more ventilation in. Because there are no actual face level vents in here, but very standard for the era. But anyway, the thing I was going to mention in that cubby hole, we have, it's all period, I love period correct stuff, AA Members Handbook for 1962. So this has all the phone numbers for different kinds of, you know, um, breakdown service it's got all breakdown stuff there addresses for hotels i'd guess in it as well all that kind of stuff um and if we get to the back oh here we are yeah um we have the map um because of course you know in this period you absolutely needed a map to be able to get the, get about the place um and i'm just hunting through it here to find yes so this is a map from 1962 of britain uh well part of it anyway this is like lancashire which is where i'm from and so it's 1962 and so all the motorways weren't really constructed yet and it has a key at the bottom that says motorway under construction motorway with access points and projected motorway most of the m6 is written down as projected motorway um only the only bits that are built is the preston bypass and a stretch between goldgate and carnforth very different country very different country back in 1962 but yeah if we just very gently feed that back into the dash it's just the business. It's just the coolest thing in the world. You do actually sit quite high up in the car, actually, but these seats are very comfy. I can imagine you'd, you know, fall about the place a bit, but, ah, oh, oh, it's just the best. You've got a little map pocket in the door and an armrest. Oh, 
of course, as you need to in any car this era. It's a bit stiff, but we have opening quarter lights as well. Oh, it's just the best. Oh, I love it. I don't want to get out. Oh, God. <laughs> but I must get in the back just for balance. Um, oh, also, I must just say quickly, look at the red door shape on a Mark II Jack. Look at that window. Oh, it's so cool. And you probably can't see this, but again, you've got an opening quarter light in the back. It's just fantastic. But in the back, there isn't actually that much room. I mean, that seat in the front is, I don't even know whether they adjust. I assume they do because it's a Jag. But um, yeah, there's, there's not very much room. Um, this car has had fitted to it seat belts because, you know, safety, uh, which it wouldn't have originally had. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite cramped in the back and you sit very low down. And curiously, there are no handles or anything. You get these little cool little lights in the back as well. Um, oh, there you go. I was, was going to say, there's nowhere for you to like tie up your debtors to. But there are these little tiny hooks on the back of the seat. So I'm going to guess that's where you'd handcuff your debtors to if you got them in the back of your Jag. Um, that's pre-murder, of course. But yeah, oh, again, the leather is lovely. Awesome car. Awesome car. Of course, the boot is important to criminals as well, um, but it's not actually a great place to throw people's bodies in once you've murdered them. It's very deep, but because of the curvaceous shape at the back, it's not that tall really so um, it's better for bullion or something um, if you've got a mate with a van then that's better for putting the bodies in um, but this this is great for the bullion because of course it's quick um, <laughs> and also in here i might, might as well just say because of course the car is being auctioned uh, there's a little photo album full of pictures of its restoration it was restored in the mid to late 2000s and all these fantastic pictures which i have to show you of it being restored um, and this isn't just me being you know, the person who's been said, oh, can you come and do a video on our car? Because we're, you know, it's been auctioned. It's really, really cool, this. I love it a lot. Even more than I thought I was going to, and I love these things anyway. It's even got, I've just noticed, it's got a lamp in the boot. I don't know whether that's broken, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's got a lamp in the boot in a car from 1950s. Just as with the engine choices, the suspension was merely tweaked. The Mark I handled more than well enough, so there was no need to re-engineer the whole thing. All the cars had pretty standard on-paper suspension, with the front end mounted on a subframe with coil springs and the rear with a live axle and leaf springs. Realistically, that does sound a little underwhelming, but as would become a theme in British cars over the coming decades, they made something really rather wonderful out of basic ingredients. The Mark I was already the go-to choice for racing drivers across the land and had started to win itself both on the track and in the forests. But there's always a way to improve and the major change for the Mark II was a new rear axle with a wider track, allowing for greater stability at high speeds. But on the new 3.8 litre cars like this, they were fitted with power steering and a limited slip differential as standard. As you'd expect from the commentary so far, the Mark II was a big success for Jaguar. Once it bought Daimler in 1960, production could increase further, and the Super Saloon Jag was matched by a V8-engined, silky smooth Daimler-badged version. Then in 1963, the S-Type was announced, being another facelift and engineering refresh of the Mark II. In the event, the 1959 Mark II survived alongside it, but together, the three cars were Jaguar's lifeblood through the decade. Despite having the E-Type as their halo, their money and volume was all made by these. This was one of Jaguar's last independent hurrahs, a truly great performance car. But the surface product is rarely indicative of a successful business. First of all, this is a British car from the 1960s, where everyone was trying to cut costs and industrial action was becoming the elephant in the room. As a result, for various reasons, Jags weren't exactly the last word in quality, and this did begin to affect sales. 
Through the 60s, Jaguar kept expanding, and while they made enough cars, they didn't have the money to finance their future. And this basic car in the luxury market was just getting old. In 1966, Sir William Lyons sold Jaguar to BMC, becoming a part, two years later, of British Leyland. And we all know how that turned out. But it did at least allow the launch of the Jaguar XJ. If we looked at this logically, the Mark II wouldn't really stand out. But it's all just a subtle tweak on things. Lots of tiny improvements that came together to propel the car into another category altogether. And it's only when we look at it holistically, when we take into account all those small improvements, that we see the shine. And what a shine that turned out to be. The Mark II Jaguar 2.4, 3.4 and 3.8 saloons are quite possibly the greatest cars of their era. And you could say that about any of its individual successes. But William Lyons wasn't telling Porky's when he came up with that tagline. From the Mark II onwards, grace, space and pace are the three attributes any good and proper Jaguar has. And with that, a little bit of disappointment. Because these cars and the subsequent S-Type and XJ were so good, they kind of ended up stunting the entire company. The whole British Leyland fiasco was bad enough, but Jaguar wound up unsure of itself, and so conservative in looking back on these days, that their utter force in designing world-beating performance cars just didn't make it into the modern world. But that's a subject for a different day. So for now, thank you very much for watching. As I mentioned earlier, this car is being auctioned by Bidding Classics, so please do click on the link below to see this and all the other cool cars they have to offer. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to Twincam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so there's a link to that in the description as well. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.